Hello, and welcome back to the Blue Lineage podcast series. On today's episode, it's been a little bit of a layoff, so uh, it's good to get back into things. Um, But on today's episode, we're into the 1960s now, Uh, kind of covered some genres, kind of reaching past uh, what we're about to talk about uh, last episode, got to funk, talked about James Brown and and how that kind of really led us all the way into the 1970s, early 1980s. But I'm going to go back a little bit and start and talk about the early 1960s and, and uh, talk about Motown, because uh, that's a big portion of this era, and it's a big portion of uh, really uh, how it really shapes the future of music as far as you know industry standards and industry uh, formula and how the business is conducted it it really uh, plays into a lot and it's all from you know essentially this one uh, record company called Motown Records so we'll talk about that and we'll get into a little bit of what will be uh, kind of this transformation um, from uh, R&B kind of influenced uh, rock and roll to this uh, European influenced rock and roll and kind of the social social movements that were going on uh, during that time and how it kind of all comes together uh, you know really all comes together in 1964 and 1964 is a, a big year so we'll talk about that and some of the some of the things around that starting this episode but we'll finish it on the next episode so first on the timeline for today uh, is Smokey Robinson and the Miracles and very integral um, band or performer if you're just talking about Smokey Robinson and Smokey Robinson the Miracles they're really known for what we just uh, briefly just talked about is the record label Motown and the Motown genre Uh, they really helped pioneer that and you know, really at its core, it's definitely R&B, R&B influenced. Uh, if we go through the timeline, you can, you know, it's very clear. Uh, but starting to get into this sort of uh, post rock and roll or sound that was forming alongside a rock and roll that was uh, known as soul. And so it definitely has those soul elements, you know, those elements of gospel kind of really makes, uh, characterize the soul music um, in a lot of ways. Uh, but at, at its core, you know, it's definitely R&B. Uh, but what sets it apart a little bit is just this formula that Motown uh, really came up with. This that really, you know, kind of sh- shifts it from R&B into the pop music genre. It's a really a pop music formula. Formula um, that's based in R&B. You can think about the business side uh, when you're talking about pop music, the industry side. Uh, but the you know the core at, the, at its core it's really R and B. So Smokey Robinson, also known as William Robinson, he got his nickname from his uncle. Uh, apparently due to his uh, his apparent love of western movies or shows. Uh, and around his in his high school years, around eighteen, he formed a vocal group uh, with Ronnie White. Pete Moore, Bobby Rogers, and Bobby Rogers' sister, Claudette Rogers, and they were at the time called Five Chimes, later the Matadors, and while they were touring, they met Barry Gordy, who was, you know, there became a longtime manager, and that same group was eventually named, renamed the Miracles, Smokey Robinson, the Miracles, so this went through all these name changes, but same, same group, as time went on and their uh, debut single got a job was actually a response to the silhouettes hit get a job which was released on chess records and so in 1959 uh, Barry Gordy uh, opened what would eventually be known as Motown Records uh, with the miracles being one of the first acts that he signed and the Miracles song Shop Around became 
the label's first major hit mm. as it reached uh, number one on the R&B and charts. And this song was re really also kind of that bass formula for the Motown sound. Uh, you know, if you go back and listen to that song, you can really uh, see that, um, you can really, you know, considering the timing, you can definitely see why that's the basis and how that's the basis. Not that it's necessarily hugely different, but uh, most of it's due to the setting. You know, this is the Miracle, Smokey Robinson, and you got Barry Gordy. And, you know, Smokey Robinson continued to write a lot of successful hits for himself and the band, you know, and he's known for his signature voice. Uh, you know, he has a unique uh, high-range falsetto voice but he also was a primary writer for the label and so you can see why you know this was a huge part of the formula because Smokey Robinson was uh, the writer of you know one of the original hits and continued to write and be the primary writer for Motown along with uh, Barry Gordy kind of you know the manager and guiding things uh, guiding things along and bringing all this different talent uh, you know, scouting all this different talent and, you know, crafting the house band and everything that went into that. Um, you know, and Smokey Robinson went on to write for, uh, write top hits for groups um, like Soul Music um, and My Guy, Two Lovers, You Beat Me to the, to the Punch by Mary Wells. Let's see, he wrote My Girl, It's Growing, Get Ready, and The Way You Do the Things You Do by The Temptations, uh, Don't Mess with Bill, and The Hunter Gets Captured by the Game, The Marvelettes, I'll Be Doggone, which he co-wrote, um, that particular by Marvin Gaye. And in addition to those, he also wrote for uh, other big artists at the time, like Aretha, uh, sorry, he wrote songs that were later recorded by artists that were uh, well-known, like Aretha Franklin and the Beatles and uh, Luther Vandross. And so during this whole time, uh, you know, there, Smokey Robinson is still actively recording and performing himself with the Miracles. And in 1967, uh, things began to slow down a little bit. And at this point, Smokey Robinson had also taken a role as vice president of the label. So he was, you know, had a lot of business obligations as well as family obligations. Uh, he eventually uh, married Claudette, uh, the member in, in his uh, band. And um, so things were, you know, he was busy with other things, so things slowed down in addition to the actual career and music slowing down. But then uh, in 1970, um, the song that was written, Tears of a Clown, was written with Stevie Wonder, became a big hit. And, of course, Stevie Wonder is, uh, guys like Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye, um, Stevie Wonder especially, you know, he was within that Motown uh, record and umbrella. I believe he worked mostly for a sub uh, label, but he was, you know, he was in that Motown record umbrella and, uh, you know, those musicians really did a lot more of their own um, recording and writing and had more freedom in that, in that light versus some of the other musicians, um, which you can, you can definitely hear to some extent. I mean, some of it is just the, pro the product of the time in that Motown sound that's general uh, soul sound you know some of that just that's just a product of the time but you can also hear some of these other artists like stevie wonder of course specifically who we'll talk about in a little bit how you know he's clearly has a a different um sound and some different you know musical goals and uh and style than you know, the rest of the Motown label. Um, in 1972, Smokey Robinson left the group. Uh, 
he wanted to launch a solo career. And he was still working at this time as a executive for Motown Records. And uh, in 1975, his hit Quiet Storm uh, released on the album also called Quiet Storm. And that really put him once again in front and center of the Motown sound. Um, and Quiet Storm, as some of you may know, uh, also created its own uh, subgenre. It's got like a niche subgenre called Quiet Storm. If you ever look into it, uh, listen to that song, and then you can s still find a Quiet Storm uh, song. It's a pretty, it's definitely a niche genre, uh, even even at the time, but I think even now, you know, it'd be hard pressed to find a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of songs referred to as Quiet Storm. But uh, then in uh, 1988, uh, Barry Gordy Jr. sold Motown Records to MCA, and and uh, Smokey Robinson continued his uh, his solo career into the 2000s. And overall, Smokey Robinson helped to write over 70 top 40 hits, which is pretty incredible. And that's kind of the essence of why Smokey Robinson and the Miracles um, were included in the timeline. Because of their own success as a band, they're one of the more prolific uh, groups, especially during that time period, um, just in their own right. But also, at the same time, it was really incredible how you know, Smokey Robinson and others um, on this on the uh, Motown record staff and their uh, house band were just churning out these, helping to churn out these hits for all these different artists. Um, you know, it's a it was incredible for the time, but also you know it's uh, fairly well known that you know, this that type of formula where you're um, sort of putting the emphasis on the the talent and uh, the house band and the house musicians and writers of the label um, to kind of focus on, on the formula, focus on what, you know, they perceive as um, what will be successful um, in, you know, mainstream uh, pop, pop music scene or also for, you know, niche scenes, niche scenes, is, if that's where they're trying to, you know, if they're trying to target those different areas as well. But, you know, that was a huge uh, um, groundbreaker and, a, you know, it really set the tempo or the, the changed the way that <clears throat> the industry really approached music groups um, from that point on. I think it, obviously when you look at rock and roll and some of the things we talked about, that was already happening. But I think from uh, the model, that Motown model, um, really, really, um, obviously it worked really well for them and it's something that labels definitely try to capture uh, down the road and something that, you know, we definitely still see in, uh, in music as far as, you know, utilizing those um, record or label tools to, um, you know, that's where you want to put a lot of focus and talent and as far as the actual production and the writing goes and you can kind of, you know, it's, you can kind of utilize that as a way to not only create a formula, but also to um, how you select your artists. You know, I think a lot of times, like we saw with rock and roll, the rock and roll artists still had a lot of uh, creative freedom and control over writing to a certain extent, even though within that formula, they were, the labels at that point were really looking for an image. And, you know, the Motown um, record label is similar in that sense, where you're kind of, into a formula, uh, you know, you definitely, you know, I think there's a little bit more var variation. I think rock and roll is pretty straightforward within Motown, you know, based on the different vocal groups and, you know, uh, the writers or, you know, the different, you know, it's a little bit different, I think, is because it's, it's more vocal based, I guess. A lot of the music sounds a little bit similar, but, you know, when you listen to different Motown acts, there's, there's a fair amount of variation in the different groups. I think mostly due to vocals uh, and, you know, some instrumental variation too and some of the different skill sets that some of the different uh, artists brought who weren't in the, the house band and whatnot. 
but anyways that that uh that formula that kind of comes out of that you can see is a lot more prevalent in modern music just where we saw you know when you think about boy bands or you know i know k-pop uh, to some degree uh, follows a similar um a similar formula where you're really just uh, largely using a staff you know it's not to say that you know these uh artists are not writing at all they're definitely contributing and many of them you know more than others but there's definitely a core group of writers that you want to have on your staff and that you can pay you know you can essentially have salaried and then with these other artists you know kind of gives you a different leverage you know these artists number one you can you can go a little bit more by appearance and you know kind of just uh style you know just at different attributes that you want in an artist and not necessarily worry about the writing or creative aspect as much you can kind of produce what you want which is pretty huge because i'm i know you know a lot of you who are big musician fans and may uh go to smaller uh, acts smaller clubs and follow local acts you know a lot of all of you know that how hard it is to really create original music you know you might see very very talented individuals uh performing making you know really cool renditions of different covers from different artists but the actual you know it's hard to really write and create original works and at that at that you know creative or incredible uh, original works that are high selling and marketable and whatnot and then to have those both come together where you have an artist that's both you know talented in you know performance but also writing that's also you know marketable from an industry perspective of course you know it's difficult so you know there's a uh, good music coming from you know all different different places you know including those type of uh more formulaic or industry spots so that's just one way to do it but i think you know that's really where i think it's a really a a, a point where uh, things change for the industry uh, motown is definitely like one of those models uh, for the future of pop music and industry music and um you know the motown label besides Smokey robinson included uh, the supremes the four tops the jackson five the temptations um and then you know some of the sub uh, labels include gladys knight and the pips um junior walker the originals i mentioned that you know uh, marvin Gaye was affiliated with them and some other artists as well and you know that that sound like i said was very much created by and crafted by Smokey robinson as the the primary songwriters and of course the um the funk brothers were known as the house band and were a huge part of crafting that uh the the rest of the sound for some of the other bands and the miracles as well and you know they were the main musicians on the studio releases and you know like acts like as i said acts like stevie wonder and and um marvin Gaye and some of those other acts really created their own uh their own works but um yeah you know when you think about the dress when you think about the dance and the sound you know all those aspects as as models for some of the music that we still see today uh it's definitely you can definitely trace it to motown and you know even further you can trace it down down to these individual artists uh to a lot of degree and as well as barry gordy jr as a as a manager and owner um and the modern day uh, motown records still exists sort of you know not necessarily as motown um but it's um it's owned by universal music group i believe Uh, so that's that you know just kind of sitting the the base as far as motown i think it's really integral because i think when you get into these uh later years on the timeline you know early on when you talk about blues and r&b you know that's kind of what it was at the time and now as we stretch it forward after kind of this almost post rock and roll era 
people will talk about soul, we'll talk about Motown, and you'll talk about all these other sh- subgenres that kind of evolve from it and really sound a lot different. And at, and I think it's, you know, in some ways it's interesting because I think we you really defined, R&B became a really uh, defined sound during this time, even though you can break down these subgenres. When you think about old R&B, of course, as we talked about, it was kind of a, uh, an umbrella term for all different black music that was coming out of the time, not necessarily what we would think of as R&B today. Um, but I think it's good to work all that out and talk about, you know, like Motown. We don't really get too much into soul. We kind of mention soul here and there because as we talked about the definition of soul or how at least it's defined with it, within this timeline as far as the sound and really uh, getting to the gospel inf- influence, um, of course, uh, a lot of it was a product of the times, um, you know, just using that that word sort of in um, contrast to what was happening in the rock and, the former rock and roll scene where, you know, you kind of saw the rock go one way and the roll go the other and the roll kind of turned into soul and in some ways um, as well. Um, so next on the list, we'll talk about uh, um, a terminology sort of uh, a, uh, on the terminology side you can see it says the battle the battles the Beatles meet Fast Domino and Little Richard while on t- tour in Europe which is uh, not fully accurate because uh, it wasn't at the same time as far as I know um, they definitely met Little Richard um, but one of the things about that, and I think we've talked about this before, as you can see on the timeline, just briefly gets into how it was easier for our many black artists to book larger shows, um, in, in Europe, in the UK. And because of that, you know, we saw a lot of black artists cross paths with some of the major uh, musical acts that we see, uh, come over this way later on and become very popular and popular in Europe as well. But of course we, we don't hear about them as much. Um, and so the, the big one, of course, then the reason it was uh, mentioned on the timeline is the Beatles because the Beatles stand out a little bit. You know, I've talked about the musical phenomenon known as the, the British invasion quite a bit, but the Beatles, and some of these other bands that sort of really come out of the rock and roll era more so than what you would think of the blues rock era are a little bit different and and of course the Beatles are just you know massive band and and you know by the time the Beatles really got to the US um, you know rock and roll that was uh, you know including the black artists that originated it as well as the artists who would um, successfully also started to play rock and roll. It, it, all that was waning and, you know, America had moved on to, you know, more of the current rock and roll players, which would have included um, the Beatles. And, you know, at the time, you know, there was a weird time where you had this sort of old, uh, these kind of old school rock and roll players per se and you had these other guys who are coming from uh, Europe and just the and just new uh, players like the, the Beach Boys and who had a different sound slightly different sound but in a lot of ways it was still rock and roll but kind of just remarketed a little bit um, and so there was a point where we saw a lot of these artists uh, like Chuck Berry and, you know, even like a pop artist like James Brown who got started in like a more of an R&B sound. They were included in some of these big shows that were really uh, taken off with some of the musicians who were just coming, coming up and were famous like the Beach Boys and also the musicians who were coming from Europe and UK. And there was a, there was a weird point where we kind of saw these artists, you know, definitely were appreciated but you could see that there was a clear trend where these pop acts were getting, you know, a lot of hype 
and potentially more hype and the previous stars you know really started it were maybe getting the same or maybe not as much um, respect and hype even though uh, you know there were definitely differences I think they were you could definitely say at that point that they were a little bit dated um, just because everything was moving so fast these sounds were transforming so fast and as we talked about in previous episodes rock and roll kind of stayed the same specifically for these artists like Chuck Berry and you know I think what was interesting for James Brown as I mentioned is you know as these new faces and artists were kind of coming up from Europe we also talked about James Brown really shifting into like that sunk that funk and soul uh, music that was coinciding with the sort of black uh, social uh, movements of the time. And that was definitely intentional for him. I know like, um, I know that a lot of people had called for this. A lot of his fans, a lot of the public called for wanting him to take a stance. And so some of it, it seemed that he did, you know, recognize just through, uh, you know, over time maturity and just witnessing and experiencing things himself. But, you know, there's also an angle that you can take where there's this clear shift from, you know, this sort of, sort of old guard of this R&B, you know, for him, it already had a funky kind of soul infused um, influence, but still was a little bit more of that, you know, R&B type hit that you know you can hear early in his career and you know kind of playing into and joining into the uh sort of black pride and socially aware and conscious activism that was happening that went along with his funk music that that all kind of came together and so you could see how some of that may have been motivated by a decreasing interest in you know, what he was playing or what he used to play as well as, you know, just a general desire to develop the sound along with the movement. Um, So it could be a little bit of both, um, you know, probably one more than the other. I don't know, but it's another angle to consider as long as we're talking about kind of the shift. And, you know, when you specifically talk about the Beatles, uh, you know, they, although they're known for their creative, very creative and innovative sound, um, certainly in their own right. We also talked about how they very clearly uh, pulled from Chuck Berry, and especially if you go back and look at Chuck Berry's, you know, entire musical catalog, not necessarily the hits. You know, it comes becomes more evident if you just listen to a lot more Chuck Berry, and and of course Little Richard too. Um, more so, uh, I think that was more a little bit more like the Beach Boys. Um, well, you could hear it a little bit more clearly with the Beach Boys because the Beach Boys are a little bit more straightforward. And, uh, of course, the Beach Boys were hugely successful as well. Uh, but with the Beatles, I think it was more uh, Little Richard's style and um, presence and less so the lyrical aspects that was that you could hear with um, Chuck Berry as well as Chuck Berry's uh, over, overall sound. You know, Chuck Berry had that kind of Western, uh, almost, you know, country-infused, bluesy uh, rock sound that you can hear on a number of um, blues hits, or not blues hits, Beatles hits that, you know, was pretty unique to Chuck Berry. But one of the things about Chuck Berry also was that that youthful content. You know, one of the things about rock and roll was how it was really, a lot of it was lyrically designed to appeal more so to the youth than it previously before and you know you saw that a little bit in R&B um, but I think for you know Chuck Berry and some of these other artists you can think of it almost as a sort of a black futurist perspective where people are talking about a you know a different the hopes and dreams um alternative lives uh, you know the portrayal of you know the near future a hope for a future for black artists you know the black community um you know uh, 
a different, more positive outlook, of course, aligning with some of these successes and some of the progresses that were seen. And of course, you saw that in the funk era. That was a big component of the funk era, black futurists, notions and ideas. Um, but I think when you kind of shifted over to the Beach Boys and what the Beatles were um, sort of utilizing it for, it becomes a little bit more, um, it comes a little bit more from a sort of futuristic idealism to more like the, uh, more kind of a, a consumerist, uh, more, more, more like more consumerist angles, like kind of the industry kind of injecting and kind of utilizing the terminology and words in the same way to appeal to a youth market to sort of, you know, not only to sell music, but I think there is a lot of, um, you know, as, we, as we've seen the industry evolve, we've seen a lot of, you know, real intentional marketing in integrated with, uh, you know, sales and marketing integrated with music, you know, advertising, this and that commercials. And so I think that's uh, something that maybe we saw a shift from because obviously, you know, there's a huge, we've talked about the cultural sort of contrasts that happen when you just start to pull, you know, music from one culture to another. You know, you can appreciate it, especially when it's the same language, you know, you can appreciate that that language and you can pull it from it and use it as your own. And perhaps why, you know, the music was attractive to some of the white audiences, the same reason it um, they were attracted to the Beatles music as well, because, you know, the language, uh, you know, at taken at face value can be seen as the same in a lot of ways and it can appeal to the youth in the same way. But as we talked about, you know, with some of these black futurist notions and some of these, uh, you know, blues and R&B songs and lyrics, they were really talking about some cultural aspects, some history, you know, some history, I mean, some experiences and some, uh, well, some idealism, futurism, uh, you know, just general fiction, you know, different types of, uh, it's all different types of um, scenarios and stories that may or may not be pulled from, you know, and they, may, they, they may be truth or they may be fiction, but it, 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 uh, you know, hits different and it's a little bit different than what we see when you just kind of extract those, you know, it's not really aligned with some of the cultural experiences and history that may have occurred or where a culture or um, group of people or an artist, you know, wants to go or wants to, you know, hopes that things will go or for their future generations or, you know, even if it's not real, you know, talking about science fiction, um, you know, it's still attached to some of these experiences and notions that they've, you know, personally experienced or, um, or, you know, the community or their culture has experienced. And so I think it definitely has a meaning, you know, for speaking about Chuck Berry or some of these artists specifically, you know, the community is, you know, hoping that these things are something that they or their children can experience as far as some of these, um, what were turned into com uh, consumerist um, notions as far as, you know, cars, you know, just, you know, summers, beach, you know, vacations, you know, all these sort of fun things that didn't necessarily exist for, you know, black Americans up until you know, from slavery, so hundreds of years to, you know, still for many, not, not yet, but, you know, for a lot of people, it wasn't sights, um, especially when you're, when you yourself as a musician, as a rock and roll icon, you know, you've been kind of thrust into this, oops, thrust into this spotlight, thrust into, you know, wealth. And so for you, at least, you know, it's uh, realistic. And then once you get there, you can kind of look around and say, you know, if, if uh, I can do it, you know, why can't you, which, you know, it's definitely more complicated than that, but, you know, that's, that's, I think that's where it comes from, where, it, where, uh, whereas for these uh, other artists that were coming over, um, from Europe or 
we're just getting into the rock and roll music and performing it and just kind of taking that style without um, without the kind of the cultural aspects and whatnot. You know, they just it just kind of came more commercial and consumerist. I think you know you can say see the same thing with modern hip hop where you feel like some people are really getting it um, from they've either lived it or they recognize it in some way or another. And other people are just kind of grasping onto these different terms and words and maybe taking out of context or, you know, just, you know, appreciating the music more at a face value level, you know, which is, you know, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that either. But, you know, there sometimes you get do get into that disconnect. Um, So I guess getting more over to where we actually saw the the past cross uh, for the Beatles and both uh, Little Richard and Fast Domino. So for Little Richard, um, before the Beatles had really made it as a premier act, while they were touring the UK with Roy Orbison, they were they got the offer and were able to open for Little Richard um, in 1962 for 14 shows, I believe it was in Hamburg. Um, and so you, you can hear them uh, talk or read about various um, situations where Little Richard or the Beatles will recall uh, Little Richard really helping them, or well, helping them, providing them tips. You know, I don't think it's super major. You know, they, they were both working at the time, obviously. And, but 14 shows is fairly extensive. And so that was that. And then after, you know, in like 1963, you know, about a year later, the, the Beatles really started to blow up. And, um, you know, when you, you when you listen to early Beatles records, uh, how they got those deals, they really turned more to a more familiar R&B and rock and roll sound, which would be modeled after Little Richard. Because at the time, they the record labels or people were not really as receptive to the Beatles sound, you know, the industry at least. I, I, I'm sure they had a strong following at that time and they were had already played some original songs that had that you know distinctive Beatles sound. But as far as the industry perspective and what they wanted to hear, um, it, they really had to go back to a little bit more of a sound that they would have uh, had refined with uh, influence and maybe also with a uh, little Richard as uh just because it was more familiar and that was the sound of the time. And then later, of course, they were able to add their creative spin and sound. Um, and, you know, in addition to Lil Richard, of course, the Beatles are known for paying heavy respects to Fast Domino. Um, they uh, definitely played songs in his name and uh, and later eventually, as I talked about when the Fast Domino uh, episode uh, Fast Domino eventually made a copy or a cover of Lady Madonna. And, you know, Fast Domino, Little Richard, um, and Larry Williams is another one, actually. And he was on the same label as Little Richard. And he's not well known, but he benefited really from Little Richard's uh, periodic departures, as we've talked about when we talked about Little Richard when he de departed a couple of times from the music scene and that gave Larry Williams kind of a, um, the more of a spotlight and attention to, uh, you know, get his own success as far as, uh, his songs. And the Beatles actually covered a number of Larry Williams songs. Uh, he, they covered him actually, uh, as it's like tied with someone else. I forget who it is with, the most covers as far as how many songs were covered how many songs of how many songs of his were covered by the beatles um and so did the yardbirds and the rolling stones so larry williams is someone who we don't really know about um but a number of major bands that were coming over from europe covered his uh his songs and it's one of those kind of bittersweet things if we talk as we talked about in the past because you can't just say that you know these songs would have been more successful if people hadn't covered them, you know, maybe we still wouldn't know about them or maybe we wouldn't know about Larry Williams at all for that matter. 
Um, but, you know, there's the other part where we just continue to see uh, a lot of these artists from Europe really, you know, I think obviously there's no, you know, there, were, there weren't bad attentions, especially from the artists. But, uh, you know, at the same time, there's clear uh, success built off some uh, level of, at the cost to some level of these, these other artists. Um, and then for Fats Domino, uh, they, the Beatles, of course, huge fans of Fat Domino, Fats Domino, Fats Domino. <sighs> And in 1964, uh, when the Beatles were touring in the U.S., they were in New Orleans, and they arranged for a meeting with Fast Domino. I believe they had just met either backstage or in their trailer before or after a show. And a few, later, few years later, the Beatles' management was able to uh, arrange for Fast Domino to come to the U.K. And so that's kind of, that kind of summarizes the whole situation. Um, it's not super neat. Uh, but the main thing was just kind of give an example. We kind of broadly covered how, you know, in different scenarios, these uh, musicians coming over from Europe, um, you know, were influenced and, uh, you know, really paid respects to some of these black American uh, music uh, musicians who really created the genres. But at the same time, uh, you know, there. I think there are a couple instances, like the Beatles, I think are a big one, just because, number one, the Beatles are really, um, you know, I, they're a massive, you know, huge band uh, in history. And I don't necessarily think that the, the, uh, the way they cross paths is uh, these guys and gals, obviously, um, you know, they play the blues, um, often in their sets, they have blues songs, and I think that it's a little bit more clear, obviously, when you ever were talking about rock and roll, you know, the lineage is clear, but I think with the Beatles, a lot of times the Beatles are given, you know, a very extreme amount of credit for originating their sound, where there's, and they're not necessarily able to pull from all the roots, because, especially when you get into, you know, their peak success, and even some of their later years, when you hear their, their music, it's especially when you get more into psychedelic, you know, and stuff gets a little bit more, um, you know, you just get stuff gets more layered and um, you just inject more and more, you know, effects and different sound into it. You can kind of increase that distance from some of the original sounds that may have gone into that. But um, so it's just not as clear. And I think the Beatles are an interesting example. Um, you know, it's uh, interesting that they've, when some of these big uh, stars are able to meet kind of before they're big and famous and how that kind of all worked out and how the, the relationship, uh, how they may have contributed to each other and whatnot. So that's, that's that. Um, and then next we got Stevie Wonder. And of course Stevie Wonder is, even though he's associated with Motown, he's really just kind of in his own lane. Uh, you know, he was a virtuoso and a very skilled pianist and uh, keyboard player as well. Great vocalist, songwriter. And, you know, his sound really kind of crosses a little bit into everything. You know, soul, neo-soul, R&B, funk, rock. Uh, he got to start singing in, in a church choir. But, um, you know, during that time, uh, as a young man, he... Uh, was a little bit more interested in like B.B. King, Jimmy Reed, Little Walter, Johnny Ace, Ray Charles. Um, uh, Stevie Wonder was born blind um, because he was born premature and he spent his first 52 days in an incubator, which is why he had permanent uh, eyesight loss. And he had learned to play the piano harmonica and drums by the age of eight and he met the Motown producer we talked about earlier Barry Gordy Jr. at the age of 13 he signed him I forget if it was like a contest or I don't remember exactly how he got in contact 
with uh, Barry Gordy Jr. But his first uh, major hit was Fingertips Part 2. It charted number one in 1963. And this success really uh, paved way for a tour. And remember, he's still young at this time, uh, still a kid. And so Motown hired a uh, tutor from the Michigan School for the Blind uh, to tour with him so he could continue to learn in school while on the road. And at this point, you know, he, Steve Wonder continued to release hits and, you know, considering his uh, age, uh, he was really just, you know, his, as far as skill, you know, on, on Stevie Wonder level, his skill was still, you know, pretty uh, raw and he was always growing and developing and the songwriting, of course, is another one when you think about maturity as being a huge factor in the ability to, to songwrite. Um, and then 1971, he moved to New York. Uh, his Motown contract was about to expire. And so this is a little bit down the road um, because he was about to turn one. Uh, sorry, turn one. He's about to turn 21, which meant that the trust, which uh, was laid aside because, um, you know, he was, he was too young at the time to get the money. The, it, his money was put into a trust. And, you know, at 21, that money would be his to use. So he's kind of preparing for that and getting ready to kind of move away and really be able to get creative control over the sound and do his own thing. And during this period, he spent a lot of time at, uh, at Electric Ladyland Studios, which was created by the uh, Jimi Hendrix, who at that time had recently passed away. But, you know, he had the state of the art studio at the time. And uh, Stevie Wonder spent a lot of it. Stevie Wonder spent a lot of his time uh, there and while he was there or during that period of time he opened uh, he opened Taurus Production Company and Black Bull Publishing and all of this just gave him that much more musical freedom and many of his songs around this time as he you know turning 21 you know getting that money being able to you know, uh, finance his own, uh, his, you know, his own, uh, businesses as well as his music and direction, even though he was still connected to, uh, Motown in, in one way or another, I believe that his production company was, um, a subsidiary of, uh, Motown records, or there's some connection that way, but yeah, he had all this musical, Freedom, in addition to that, and that maturity, and, you know, just growing up, as we talked about, a lot of his songs took on more of a social and political nature, and also, it was an interesting time, because he was able to utilize the latest uh, electronic music technology, of course, he's well known for his synthesizer, and it really just pushed his music to a whole other level, so all this kind of just came together, and, you know, he's well known for, uh, playing all the instruments on his studio recordings, uh, which included um, Superstition, released in 1972. Uh, besides the horn players, uh, all the instruments were played by him. And, you know, this was a po this was a point in time when you think about Superstition, it's pretty funky, and a lot of these songs at this time really started to incorporate uh, those funk elements. And... Um, as far as the political and social uh, content of songs, a really good uh, song from that time period was Living for the City. Um, There's also You Don't You Haven't Done Nothing, um, which actually had um, background vocals done by the Jackson 5. And that was kind of a critique of the current uh, liberal agenda or stance, liberalism at the time, which... Uh, you know, it's not to say that he was on the other side, but it's more so that, you know, I don't know where he stood politically at the time. I don't want to speak for Stevie Wonder. But, you know, just during those days, I think people are more likely to be critical of even their own party in a way that is more constructive, I think, than how we think about bipolarized sort of politics uh, in the current age. So... Anyways, you know, those songs are good to listen to. Uh, Living for the City is an 
definitely a great song. Um, then let's see, in 1960, or sorry, 1976, he released I Wish, uh, Sir Duke, and a version of Isn't She Lovely, which were all hits. Um, in 1980, uh, his album Hotter Than July showed uh, kind of the a shift in the overall overall music scene and just where he was. It was like a it had like elements of reggae, funk, and a little bit of like this uh, hip hop sound. You know, this is 1980, so hip hop was just uh, really newly being born, and you could hear this with Master Blaster jamming. You know, it was a good example of kind of this, this different sound, but it also, you know, it was also a standout song in, in that album. So it's not necessarily super representative of his sound at the time, but you can kind of see there's an experiment, a lot of experimentation going on, and all of these elements are included. Uh, his song "Happy Birthday" was a key piece in the campaign to make uh, Martin Luther King's birthday a national holiday. Uh, Stevie Wonder also co-wrote or wrote some uh, movie soundtracks um, including The Woman from Red in 1984 sorry Woman in Red 1984 and Jungle Fever in 1991 as well as a soundtrack for his own documentary and he supported other artists with their music like Inner City Blues by Marvin Gaye and uh, Quincy Jones uh, Q's Joint Juke did I just say that? Juke Joint. Yeah, I just said that backwards. Uh, Q's Juke Joint. Um, and yeah, you know, Stevie Wonder is still around. Yeah, he continued to release hits in into the 90s and 2000, and he's still, you know, musically active uh, to some degree, at least at the time of this podcast. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's Stevie Wonder. I mean, he's one of those people who was just, uh, I think especially since you know, he's still around today. Um, people kind of are familiar with them, so I don't have to get as into some of the history and some of the current uh, happenings with him. But, you know, just uh, really a standout musician, a very uh, major contributor into some of these sort of uh, ambiguous genres that we get into in like the late 1970s and 1980s where we got funk, but we're also getting a lot of international and, you know, Caribbean, a lot of different uh, influences that are also kind of in being being infused into um, the music that we're talking about um, on this timeline. So interesting, I think. Steve Wonder, you know, one one of the the best to do it. And then lastly, just briefly touch on uh, another terminology item on the timeline which is freedom summer and freedom summer is essentially a it was a movement within a bigger movement um it was to increase black voter registration uh, specifically in mississippi and it was basically uh part of a project of some student organizations and activist organizations um, uh, the Congress of Racial Inequality the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and overall the goal is to increase black voters in the south and of course Mississippi was probably was the worst um, as far as that ability you know even though uh, African Americans had gotten the right to vote federally a lot of these places were trying to use uh, local measures to combat that federal that federal right and you know it took place took as many as you may know it took you know different forms uh, suppressed through uh, violence uh, tactics uh, and some more like covert tactics which were like the the literacy and aptitude tests uh, people have to take poll taxes you know a, bu a bunch of different stuff to try to prevent registration for a number of reasons of course in the south even though we're talking about post great migration you know there's always been a very strong 
strong uh, presence in the South. You know, it's not like slavery ended and then, you know, black people just all went to the North or West or wherever, you know, that, you know, the South is still very, very black in a lot of ways. Um, and of course, at, in this time, we're still seeing a shift from rural to metropolitan. So some of the more like Montgomery, um, it, Montgomery, Alabama, and some of these other uh, places where we saw a little bit more success with some of these voter movements, definitely in the rural areas is where there are even more challenges. Um, So, yeah, the 1964 Freedom Summer, it was a more coordinated and widespread effort, you know, to address this larger problem. And, you know, I think the idea by focusing on Mississippi um, was not only was it probably the most challenging and worst uh, spot to try to do it in, but, you know, just focusing not on the entire South, but focusing on a, on a single uh, point you could essentially overwhelm or overflow these kind of target areas. And in this case, it was with predominantly white college students uh, to the point where, you know, the responses and tactics they're, they're using were not going to be effective just because you're having this mass, you know, idealistically or ideally thousands of people just kind of trying to get all of, all of these uh, voters registered at once. Hopefully, you know, it just becomes a point where it, they're overwhelmed they can't utilize these tactics it just becomes too much and at the same time you know you won't get these violence violent um attacks and all of that just because you know it's been made clear that this is a unified movement that was the idea at least and in addition to that voter registration goal there are also educational goals there are the freedom schools and um you know, there's an agenda, a political agenda to try to, you know, kind of change the face of some of the delegates, delegates in Congress and uh, as the assembly. Um, and so all this kind of came together to, uh, you know, like I said, it was mostly uh, college students, predominantly white college students. Uh, they faced a lot of opposition both violence, arrests, arson, beatings, uh, you know, all of that sort of resistance that you can imagine or have seen before on a, you know, when looking at the history. And one of the things, though, is that, you know, this opposition was to these white, very often affluent, because you think about, you know, it's Freedom Summer, so we have like a lot of these college students. And, you know, when you don't just take about, take, think about face value uh, or race value as far as, you know, these are white affluent students, you know, in those cases, you're going to have connections. Most likely your family will be connected. So for these students, you know, a lot of these students are, are connected to higher, uh, higher power areas, places, uh, businesses you know, political connections, whatnot. And, you know, because to do this, obviously, it's it's summer. Um, you know, you're in college, and, you know, if you're not, if you don't need to work, I know college was different at the time, but if you're not needing to work, or, you know, you, you need to have basically some sort of supply, some money flow to pay for gas and to, you know, uh, you know, essentially survive, um, without some sort of uh, income of your own. Um, and of course, for this movement, uh, the volunteers were supposed to, um, in many cases, get uh, Mississippi driver's license and license plates. So it was a whole process. Um, and so you kind of had to relocate for the summer. So, so of course, you know, in a lot of cases, these were going to be more affluent um, individuals who were able to participate in this and because of that, the opposition they faced, it got a lot of attention, a lot of national media attention, as well as government attention, because all of a sudden, you know, you were, you're messing with people who had that sort of uh, additional power, links to power, to uh, to see that as a little bit more problematic. And 
also, of course, the media is going to follow this type of uh, story because it's, you know, it's attractive. It's interesting. And so, you know, even though the goal they tried to, they, they successfully connected with the community, um, you know, the schools and everything um, politically, I think a lot of those connections were made. But as far as actual registration to actually register and have those votes count, it basically failed. They registered or attempted to register quite a few thousands of people, but very few of them were actually um, recognized and counted. But with that media and that public attention aspect, uh, that was a huge component of the, the I think it was 1965 uh, civil rights uh, voting bill that was passed. And of course, a lot of the other, like the schools and some of the other social um uh, some of the other social goals and just having uh the college students have that experience it was huge for some of the later uh, civil rights and social rights activist goals and the reason it was on this timeline of course was in addition to that uh, a lot of these students were able for the first time to really get exposed to uh, some of the, these rural blues artists and the artists, the music that was really still, uh, you know, integrated in the culture into some of these rural areas. Uh, so some of the older R and B and um, blues style artists, as well as you know, just being into some of these uh, like juke joints, some of these clubs that are in Mississippi and other places in the South that you know have a really different feel than you would get in. Uh, some of the more northern urban um, cities like Chicago or Memphis, you know, New York. Uh, it's definitely a different, different feel, and you get a little bit more. Even to this day, you know, if you go down there, um, you know, you'll get some some Delta blues artists that you don't you just, you just don't really see unless you really look for them um, other places. So it was a big exposure, and it kind of helped a, uh, a revival to a certain extent of some of these uh, these other styles of blues or artists that may have already been well known and got a little bit of a a little bit of a revival, revival themselves as well and of course this coincides with uh, other things that were happening at the time we you know the music phenomenon not fun blah 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 the music phenomenon known as the British invasion you know that's blues infused so you kind of have all of this blues kind of coming back or just being, you know, resurged or re, whatever, revived all at once, you know, in this year. So 1964 was a pretty, and that time period was pretty huge. And you kind of kind of see how it really kind of all kind of explodes and peaks. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the next episode, because uh, that's all we got for today. We'll kind of stop partially through 1964. And we'll talk a little bit more about the same year next time. Um, we'll get a little bit more into the funk once again, because we talked about James Brown a little bit. And just because we were talking about him specifically at the time, we had to get into it because he is one of the originators. But we'll talk about a little bit more and kind of the different uh, genres that kind of coincided that as long as as well as blues rock of course the british invasion as i said and you know we're getting close to some of the early uh sounds of hip-hop as well so we're really getting into this interesting time where you get uh funk rock and and uh hip-hop and some of these in-between genres and it's interesting for black music because you're really shifting from a time where you know obviously this is still during the motown era all of this so you're having an interesting point where you're getting black music that's really very industrial and pop pop uh, focused and mainstream but at the same time this whole time you're getting these artists who are kind of really creating this uh, uh, this these sounds that are really um, infused and uh, um, run right along with what the black community is uh, experiencing not to take anything away from these other sounds because the Motown era was huge too in a lot of ways, just as far as um, 
you know, kind of setting that other standard of life as far as this new sort of industrial um, urban style where you get, of course, integration was happening and just, you know, clubs, you know, Motown, black labels were popping up and you're seeing different opportunities and different nightlife and uh, forms of nightlife that um, weren't previously, you know, just didn't exist. So it's all good. You know, it all works out uh, one way or another. But, um, you know, we've already talked about Motown, so we'll focus on some of these other sounds as we move forward uh, through the timeline. So once again, thanks for listening. Uh, Thanks for staying with it during this uh, little bit of a hiatus and look forward to seeing y'all next time. Thanks.